Know your financial capabilities. Know your financial limits. My channel if you haven't subscribed yet then make sure that you click the subscribe button below and join the revolution let me start off this video by saying thank you for 9k baby baby <laughs> thank you so much guys for all the love that you've shown my channel I really appreciate it let's keep subscribing let's keep sharing let's keep growing so if you haven't subscribed yet and I'm talking to you yes you 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 over there look at you hey? I know you're watching this right now and you haven't subscribed. Are you not embarrassed? This is really embarrassing. Come on now, click subscribe. Why? For the good times, for the vibes. Say it with me now, for the babies. <laughs> so in today's video, I'm going to be talking about how on earth I moved to America. So for those of you who don't know, I'm currently studying in America and my major is accounting with a minor in management and I'm going into my fourth year. So I graduate pretty much next year. So now the question is, how did I get there? How I ended up studying in America is I actually worked with an agency. So when I started my journey, there were two agencies that I was looking at and I'm not going to name drop however one of the agencies something that I didn't like about them is that they were kind of discouraging they sort of gave this feel of like you know you're not gonna make it you can't do it it's so difficult to get in basically making me feel like I have to be Albert Einstein for me to study in America and just to talk about my grades my grades were like between 70s 80s I had a 190 for business studies. That's my final matric report. Um, but yeah, those are my marks. In grade 11, my marks were between like basically 70s and 80s. So my marks were not extraordinarily high, but I would say they were definitely good. I don't know if that's average. That's, that's pretty. That's, that's pretty average. <laughs> But anyway, so one agency made me feel like nothing was possible, but the other agency, the one that I did eventually work with, just made me feel like there's just hope and that if I try, it's possible and voila, here I am. And basically what this agency does is it works with schools in Australia, the UK, America, different parts of the world. And what they do is they sit with you, they find out where you want to study, what you want to do. And once you go through all that, they basically start applying to schools for you where you want to study. They also negotiate scholarships for you with these schools so the agency doesn't give the scholarship but they negotiate the scholarship they also organize for you to write your SAT or your I think it's like two full test I don't know how to pronounce it but based on where you're going to study you may find yourself having to write a test I myself had to write an SAT test and how I studied for my SAT I literally got this book and did a bunch of practice tests and stuff and that's how I was prepared to do my test I did the test and I think it was UJ or Vitz I don't remember it was years ago but I did the test in UJ and SAT basically guys is like an NBT test national benchmark test I don't know what SAT stands for and they also tell you all the documents that you need so I know I had to get references from my school references from like just the community to prove that I do community service um, I got a reference from my church and where else I don't remember but yeah you just have to get some references of people to basically vouch for you and you also have to get your grade 11 and matric results by the way you can actually work with this agency starting from literally grade 10 11 12 um, I worked with them when I was in grade 12 however they do accept people from 10 11 12 because when you come to them early they're actually able to work with you so that you can basically work your way so you can actually get into those schools and the scholarships that you can get are pretty much based on academics music, um, sports. So whatever your skill is, wherever you excel, you can use that to try and get a scholarship. I don't know too much about the music and sports because I got an academic scholarship, but I know for music and sports, you have to like um, put your highlights together to show you playing sports or show you playing music, etc., etc. So if you guys are interested in working with this agency, then just send me an email and we shall connect and take the next steps. I must say, however, that this is not a free service. This is obvious right <laughs> it's like why would they why, why would they do this for free why, why why would they do this for free so I think you can expect to pay something between 16 to 18 thousand for the services in total and another thing is the agency actually negotiates scholarships for you but they do not give you the scholarship it is the school in the end that decides if they're going to give you a scholarship or not and scholarships can actually range between half scholarship quarter or actually a full scholarship I know someone who worked with the same agency that got a full scholarship 
scholarship for medicine i got a half scholarship for i have not decided my major yet so it was just like hmm general academic half scholarship but yeah guys that is basically how i went to america for those who cannot work with an agency i know that it is actually possible for you to do this by yourself without an agency it's just that it's gonna be like more taxing and stuff like that but just basically google areas google schools that you want to go to try find their global education page or international studies or whatever and i'm sure there's gonna be an email there reach out to someone and i guess just start your process again i can't speak too much about that because i personally did not do it by myself but I must say it is possible so don't think that because you cannot afford to work with an agency that it's not possible for you to study abroad I must say though that one thing that you must consider when you want to study abroad is be realistic about what you can and cannot afford because you need to consider the exchange rate of South Africa I mean if you're going to move to America to Europe and of course you know that our money the Rand is much lower than the dollar or the pound so whatever fees you have you must understand that they will be affected by exchange rate and exchange rate changes guys all the time so be realistic about what you can afford because you may get a half scholarship that means you must be able to pay the remainder of that scholarship or you might get a full scholarship academically but still have to cover your room and board and your meal plan if you are going to get a meal plan I know some schools require you to actually have a meal plan so if you want to study abroad guys definitely be sure about your finances how you are going to pay for it for the full four or five years etc etc and another thing is it is possible to apply for more scholarship when you are actually there which is what I did but anyway I'll go into that later in the video so when it comes to my visa interview for the American visa I had to bring my DS 160 which is the application form I had to bring I think about two two to three passport photos however when you do your DS 160 application you already take a picture so they might use that one but they might not so bring additional photos um, you have to pay two fees I think it's a visa payment fee and a service fee the service fee is $160 which is about 2,200 Rand um, but yeah those are the two things that you can expect to pay you also need to bring three months bank statement from um, both your parents one parent or whoever's going to be financially supporting you and the purpose of this is they want to see that you can actually afford to study in America and you'll be able to sustain yourself or they'll be able to support you when you are there you will also have to bring your letter of admission from the school as well as your scholarship letter if you do get a scholarship lastly you can only apply for a visa once you get accepted into the school because when you go there of course I said you have to bring your admission letter scholarship letter but your school will also send you a document called your I-20 your I-20 guys is basically the equivalent of your passport as an international student like you you need it when you are traveling but your school you can only get it from your school who has accepted you so for the next part of this video i actually want to talk about finances someone reached out to me before and said can i actually discuss what my finances are as an international student so i'm not going into details like figures and numbers but i'm pretty much going to give you a rough overview on what my expenses are and what yours may be if you go and study abroad so as i mentioned some schools require you to have a meal plan so my scholarship again was only a half scholarship and I had to pay the remaining half and I had to pay room and board and for a meal plan so for my school if you are a freshman it goes freshman sophomore junior senior when you are a freshman in your first year you have to live in certain buildings you can't live anywhere else and when you live in those buildings you have to have a meal plan so you can't just cook for yourself you have to have the meal plan so you can get access to the cafeteria and the other eating places on campus so I had to pay for those things but what I did to alleviate this stress is I did two things number one I became an RA and that's not the only reason I became an RA but I became an RA an RA is a resident advisor which is someone who works on campus in the residence halls and basically you supervise the people that live there make sure people are okay not dying etc etc so I became an RA when you become an RA your school will automatically cover your room and board because of your job and they cover it based on your position so at my school there's an RA who gets full room and board coverage but then you can also be a CA which is a community advisor where they only cover half of your room and board so really it depends on the school it depends on your position in residence
best life but anyway doing that took away the expense of having to pay for room and board and the second thing that you could do that I was actually not able to do is when you move out of first year housing again this depends on your school you are able to pick a different meal plan which is less expensive now because of my job I remained with freshmen for a second year and then after that I moved to another building which required me to have the same meal plan so I couldn't get a less expensive meal plan however in the upcoming year I'm going to be an SRA this is a senior resident advisor so basically I got promoted yay oh my god wow but with being an SRA it means I can actually have a bronze meal plan which is less expensive but I must say for people who do live in different buildings you can even have no meal plan or you know if you commute if you stay somewhere else you don't need a meal plan now I could not commute because again I'm an international student and I have no family in America like none like zero so i did not have the option of living off campus and living off campus of course means you have to find a place pay for rent etc etc so i didn't have that option but that is an option for you another thing that i did which you are able to do as well is i looked for additional scholarships so as i said i started out with my scholarship that only covered half of my tuition but i've since gotten two more scholarships which have helped cover my tuition and these again are academic scholarships that i got because i cannot do music and I don't play sports so ha, had to stick to the books but yeah that's something that you can do is actually seek more scholarship however there actually is a cap based on the state that you are in that says you can only receive so much in scholarship let's say you already have a scholarship for like 10,000 this is just an example these are not like the actual numbers of what is allowed but let's say you have a scholarship for ten thousand dollars and you get another one for five thousand if ten thousand dollars is the cap then what they'll do is they'll reduce that scholarship to five and then bring in the other one and you'll have ten that's something that's actually definitely messed up is you may not even get the full scholarship if you are over the cap that you are allowed to receive so when it comes to my actual finances where i get money like just for like you know living and stuff basically my parents give me an allowance at the beginning of a semester they give me money once in the semester and I pretty much have to manage my funds to make it last for the entire semester a semester is four months so you have two semesters in a year the first semester starts in August so in America the academic year actually starts in August so the first semester is called the fall semester it starts in August and ends in December then you get a month off from December until sometime in Jan when the second semester starts which is called the spring semester which starts in Jan and ends in May and that makes up one year so that's why when I go back now I'm actually starting my fourth year which means by the way also if you're studying in South Africa you are not graduating with your friends that's something that I'm actually experiencing is my friends are graduating like literally in December but I'm only going to graduate in May and that's because I only started school in August instead of in the beginning of the year when my friends started but another form of income is I actually have three jobs so the first job that I have again is being a resident advisor the second job that I have is I do the social media for one of my school's offices the office of diversity equity and inclusion and the third job that I have which is not like a job job really it's more like a commission thing with a company in South Africa but obviously that goes to my South African account so I don't actually have access to that month to month but yeah so I have two jobs on campus and the reason why I only have jobs on campus is because international students again this is based on the country that you're in but international students are not allowed to have off-campus jobs if you do that you will threaten your visa status and you might get deported and so you are only allowed to have on-campus jobs which is why I only have on-campus jobs but definitely as a student based on where you're studying and what the rules of the country are you can definitely increase the amount of money you have by getting jobs one or more but remember that you are a student more than you are anything else that's the one thing they always say to us is you are always a student number one you cannot allow your off-campus work or your work in general to get in the way of you being a student because obviously you want to you know graduate and graduate in time so that you can start seeing a return on your investment or your parents can start seeing a return on your investment so now that I've told you guys what my jobs are and how my money sort of is set up I want to talk about some of the spending principles that I apply in my life or rather let me say the money principles that I apply in my life so the number one rule for money for me because I'm a Christian 
is I always pay my tithe. On every single salary that I receive, I always, always, always pay my tithe. I try not to skip. I would rather overpay, but I never underpay. And that's because the verse in the Bible where God says that you must pay your tithe and test him in this way and he will give back to you. Press down, shaken together, more than what you can imagine. It's an analogy my pastor always says where he's like, what do you say? He was like, when you have an apple, you don't eat the seed, you plant it. You have the, you know, you have the whole apple but when it comes to the seed you plant it and then you will get more apples from that and that's his analogy with tithe and something else that he said that was actually quite profound I felt is he was like just because you have been deceived by a false prophet doesn't make God's word any less God's word and what he means by that is of course you know there are some false prophets who will literally scam people of their money they'll use church money to like basically chop life or make you pay for like you know to actually see them the gospel is free Jesus never charged anybody in the Bible for his services but there's actually a story in the Bible where God was very upset with people because they were building their houses and they didn't build his house the church anyway I don't want to preach too much what I'm saying is that for me is a principle that I follow in my life now along with that I told you guys that giving is everything Another thing that I do, and again, it's a person to person thing. These are my things, guys. I'm not saying that this is gonna work for everybody. Not everybody can do it, not everybody wants to apply it, but I'm just telling you that this is how I run my life. I believe that to give is to receive. So every single semester, I always make an effort to donate money to some kind of charity or, you know, just anywhere where I can donate. Every semester, I always make sure that I do that and I donate to causes that I actually believe in. And the reason why I do that is because, you know, I just feel like if you have, give. And the thing about giving is you will never have money to give. You always have to allocate it. You always have to put money aside. It's not gonna just be available, you understand? Because money always has a purpose. By the way, your money must always have a purpose. But money always has a purpose. And so if you want to give, you have to actually give your money a purpose and say, you, I'm going to give with you. Another thing that's important about giving is give according to your level. And number two, giving does not always have to be money. Giving can be time and volunteering. The principle that I apply is saving. I treat my saving just like I do my expenses. What do I mean by that? When I get money, I literally pull out my savings first as though they are an expense. Because something that my mom actually taught me is that saving is not something that you must do with like what you have left behind but it's something that you must do with money as soon as it comes in if you can of course this is based on what money you receive and what your responsibilities are so it is important to have money for rainy day especially as an international student you really never know what could happen again because you are an international student when something happens other people are able to go to their family their uncles they are basically able to get help but because you might be alone in the country you might not have a place where you were able to get financial help. So it is very important for you to have savings. So moving on to the next point, something that you always need to remember is just because you have the money for something doesn't mean you can afford it. Yes, I have money, but I don't have money for that. That's a very important distinction to make. Otherwise, you're going to find yourself spending money on things that you do not need. And the next thing is, guys, ordering food, ordering food, ordering food. Yo, my money proper goes to food. This is why I have a big belly because my money just goes to food. But ordering food really does catch up to you. Number one, it's not helping. Number two, those $10, $20, $5 literally add up in the end and you find yourself spending a lot of money. Try not to fall into the trap of ordering a lot of food. The next point might sound a bit contrary to the last point because you know, you know, just, just hear me out. Do not spend money on things that you don't want to spend money on. Don't get me wrong, you probably want to spend money on food, right? Yeah, but you know, there's a limit. But when I say don't spend money on things that you don't want to spend money on, I mean if your friends are literally going out, like for instance, I don't drink. So if my friends are going out to drink, I'm not going to contribute to their money for alcohol because <laughs> I don't drink. So why am I contributing to alcohol? So just trying not to fall into the pressure of university where because people are doing things, now you find yourself doing things even though you don't want to and you're spending money that you don't have. And that's another thing again, know your financial capabilities, know your financial limits. Do not go around trying to compete with everybody in university or with certain people. Because let me tell you something again, as an international student, you have no backup, no plan B, no one to fall on. 
other students in the country have family if they f up and use all their money those people can go home guys they'll be fine but you don't have that do not compete with people financially know your capabilities and live according to that make a budget budget for your money and by all means try 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 and stick to the budget so guys that pretty much wraps up these videos those are my financial tips that I actually apply in my own life and that is how I came to study in America remember if you are interested in working with the agency then please feel free to shoot me an email by the way if you guys want me to do a video talking about the struggles of being an international student and some tips then comment down below otherwise that's it for today guys I hope you like this video don't forget to comment like share and subscribe and I will be back with more videos peace and love guys